Well, for us parents, okay, are old enough to, for our kids to have been when they were little, to be in the past, or maybe for you young parents, because you might have toddlers now, how many of you have ever had the little ones imitate you? Yeah, a few hands there, nods, yep. I love when that happens. I used to love it when, I was, when my kids were little. They would imitate me doing certain things, imitate my wife. I love the image. One of my favorite images is a dad cutting the lawn, all right, and then his little boy or whatever uh, using his little toy uh, lawnmower so proudly, just like, man, I'm being just like dad. Look at me. I'm cutting the lawn, too. I think that stuff is precious. I love cute stuff like that. We expect kids, right, especially when they're little, even sometimes when they're older, to imitate their parents. Sometimes it can be for good or for ill, right? And, you know, we even expect, unless they're adopted, to look like their parents, right? To appear like their parents in various ways. So you would expect, or at least hope, that Christians, those who we've learned in Ephesians are in Christ, being children of God, would look like God, live more and more into his image, right? Right? And that's exactly where Paul goes next here in our, in our series in Ephesians. Open your Bibles, if you would, or your app to Ephesians 5. And it opens with the words, Therefore, be imitators of God. This is how we are to live. Be a great summary of much of the Christian life, right? Recall that for chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians showed us what? Who we are our identity, who we now are in Jesus Christ and what we have in him. And then chapters 4 through 6 now are called to live out who we are, to simply be more and more of who we already are in Jesus, what that looks like. And so today in Ephesians 5, 1 through 14, we're going to continue to learn how to walk. A walk, walk is a biblical metaphor for how to live, how to live as believers in Jesus Christ, those who are in Christ. So our big idea for us as believers is, Uh, As children of God, we are to be imitators of God by being more and more who we already are in Christ. In other words, be like God and be who you are. And God enables us to grow in that. But we've learned, right, in Christ we are elevated. That's a status we already have. We've been saved. We're headed toward heaven. We have eternal life. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. Jesus lived the perfect life we couldn't, died on the cross in our place rose again, and so now we are elevated, so live elevated. That's the point. Don't be like who you were before you came to Christ, before you and I were converted, or like the world, those who don't know Christ, but we are to, look, we are to live out our new life in Christ. So let's first look at the call itself, to be imitators of God. It says in verses five, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So, therefore, refers to what precedes. What precedes? Well, verse 32 of chapter 4 that we saw last week. And it says in that verse, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Who's a Christian? Among other things, we're forgiven. What do we do? We forgive. It would be really weird if a Christian did. It means they don't understand what Jesus did for them. And so what Jesus did for us is not only the motivation, it's also the model. So there's already an impetus of imitation of God going right into this verse, in verse 32 of chapter 4. So no wonder he says, therefore, be imitators of God here in uh, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. We could get those two verses up on the screen here as a backdrop for what we're going to talk about further. So notice in view of these verses, by the way, imitating God, I love this, it's so awesome, imitating God is connected to who we are. It doesn't say it in a vacuum. It says it in context. And what is it? It says, as beloved children. So right there we see, don't we, that we are to live out of an identity that we already have. Beloved is what we're called. So beloved, be loved. Right? We talked recently how important it is that we would know the love of Christ. But not only is those who've received it and are experiencing that we would walk in love, that that would be our lifestyle. You are a blood-bought child of the living God. 
if indeed you've put your faith in Christ. And so why wouldn't we want to be like him? By the way, this shouldn't be too hard. Not only does God give us supernatural power by his Holy Spirit, but even as human beings, we are, we, <laughs> we are natural imitators, are we not? I mean, think about it. I, I, I get a kick out of this. Look at any group of middle schoolers or high schoolers, right? And with a few exceptions, they pretty much look the same, right? Same hairstyles, same clothing. The styles change, but the imitation continues from generation to generation. So the question is not, will we imitate? The question is, who? Will it be the world, the culture around us that does not know God, or the God who loves us? That's the question. So chapter 5, we're going to to spend a few weeks in it. It contains multiple ways that we are to walk, that is to say live. We're going to look at the first two of those today, and the first one of those two is this, is that we are simply to walk in love. That's what we're to do, but again, it's not in a vacuum. It comes out of who we are, beloved children of God. We've received his love. We're paying it forward. We're the ones who are the beloved children of God, who imitate God. So we are to have love as our way of life. Now, none of us are necessarily perfect in this. It's something we grow into more and more of who we already are in Christ. It's part of how we imitate God makes sense, because in 1 John, twice it says God is love. So it makes sense this would be part of our imitation. By the way, it also says God is light. And we're going to see that come up a little bit later in terms of walk, to walk as children of light. And so this is agape love. This is God's kind of love that we're to model and grow in. It's not the world's what's-in-it-for-me kind of love. Um, And so God gives us the ultimate picture or model of this kind of love, right? Because where else do we get a more ultimate and perfect model of this? Rather than just giving us principles, he gives us a picture. And no surprise, the picture is Christ himself. And so you go to verse 2, and it says this, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So notice this is the kind of love we are to walk in, what kind of love we are to imitate that Christ pictures for us in his death on the cross for us in our place. And notice a few things. One, it's self-giving, right? Um. uh, It says, gave himself up for us. And so that's the kind of uh, love we can imitate. It it is easy. It's the gravitational pull of the human heart. It's the unfortunate gravitational selfish pull of my own heart in the flesh that I need to war against, that I can grow against. The gravitational pull of our heart is living a what-can-I-get sort of orientation in life. It can become the slow, hum, little subconscious backdrop. But this calls us to a conscious life of what can I give in light of the fact that he gave everything for us. And of course, it was not only self-giving, it's sacrificial, right? We have an Alaska team sacrificing time, energy, and money to go and serve. If you were cold and coatless, I would like to say I'd give you the coat off my back. I think I'd do that. And I'd like to say it's because of the kind of guy I am. Maybe, maybe not, but more than anything, it's because of the God that gave everything for me. I can live more consciously of what I can give for others as I keep him in mind because what he did was sacrificial. His, our well-being for his life, he caught, he, it costs his life for you and your place, my place. So we see that sacrificial. We see it's pleasing to God. I think that's what the word fragrant offering there is getting at. It harkens to Old Testament imagery, the sacrificial system that pointed to Christ. And then notice who it was done for in the verse. It was done for us. Well, who are we? Did he do this for us? Did he give us eternal life because we're just such great people or super religious? No. We can't earn earn salvation. So he died for us while we were what? Sinners. His enemies, right? I was never God's enemy. Well, yeah, 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 you were. The Bible tells us that's what we were. Is in Romans 5.10, part of it says, For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. And it goes on from there. So this is an example for us. Listen, the unbeliever, a person who doesn't follow Christ, they love their friends. They love their family. But who doesn't? That's easy. Anybody can do that. You can be evil and do that. 
But the believer is called to this kind of love where we love even our enemies, even those who positively oppose us. And that's the kind of love pictured here. It's an otherworldly kind of love. And so walking in love is like that. He starts with a model of Christ, what to do. But helpfully, what comes next is what not to do, what that doesn't look like, the way the world lives, right? What not to model. And so notice verse 3. He jumps into this. He says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. You're actually a saint. You don't need the Vatican to vote you in. This is the biblical term used for Christians, those who are set apart, holy in the sight of God through their faith in Christ. And so it follows that we would live like it. And this shows you how not to, right? Now, now why these sins here in particular in verse 3? Um, it could be any sins, right? But perhaps because they're not only antithetical to who we would now be in Christ, but think about these sins for a moment. They're absolutely antithetical to love, right? Because they're all about selfishness self-orientation, self-indulgence, self-pleasure, which is the opposite of self-giving. And they grieve the Holy Spirit, they harm others, can destroy families, even harm ourselves even. Does not 1 Corinthians 6.18 say this, flee from sexual morality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. So maybe that's why, but notice what, uh, what these things are, right? So it says sexual morality, right? Which might be obvious for some, all acts of sexual sin, right? The Greek word underlying here is porneia. It's where we get uh, the word pornography from, which is a visual or verbal depiction of sexual morality. It's itself a sin. To kind of explore what this is a little bit more, I, let me uh, cite a question. I, it was a great question. Uh, my, we're friends of a family in Chicagoland that we knew from back when we were in Chicagoland. They come from a, a, a Hindu background, an offshoot of Hinduism. Indian Americans who uh, uh, came from that kind of religious background. And so they're exploring Christianity. It's actually been amazing to see how God's working in them. And the son is 18. He's about to go off to college, super smart kid. And so he called me and he said, hey, I want to investigate Christianity. I said, that's great, that's awesome. He says, so how about this? I'll read one or two books of the Bible and then can I call you like once a month and just fire a bunch of questions at you? Which he does, like two and a half hours worth. I'm, I'm not kidding. And uh, one of them, I was like blown away by this one. He's like, you know, we live in an impure, impure world. I'm like, man, I'm amazed he noticed that. He says, it's hard to live pure in that world. I'm like, you got it. He said, man, what is the Christian sexual ethic? Like, tell me in a sentence or two. I'm like, well, okay. Good question. So, so I gave it my best shot, and I responded something like this. I said, in reading the Bible front to end, right, you can't help but come away with a very clear impression from it, both in principle and practice, that any sexual expression, whether of mind or of deed, that is outside the marriage of one man and one woman, you find out is sin. It's against God's will. So that was my best shot at a one-sentence summary of the sexual ethic. And then regarding purity, and to be pure, we first need to come to Christ, be forgiven, have eternal life, and then have the Holy Spirit indwell us, and by his power to grow against our struggles and temptations in these areas as we follow and heed God's word. And so sexual immorality in light of all this, but more important in light of the scriptural witness, would include or, or be like the, all the, there's a whole laundry list of extramarital and unnatural kinds of stuff, the stuff laid out in the prohibitions in Leviticus. You can look at those on your own or the back half of Romans 1, Romans 18, Romans 1, 18 to 32, or 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Things like adultery, incest, homosexuality, so on and so forth, big long list. And it even includes, not popular in our culture right now, but any premarital or extramarital sex because in light of 1 Corinthians 7, 2, which says, but, the tempt but of the temptation to sexual immorality, I'm sorry, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. So the Bible is very clear on, on its sexual ethics. That's sexual immorality, kind of a catch-all term, but then there's impurity which is in the same vein, but catches anything not already covered in the acts that define 
sexual immorality. So it include things like a, a, a probably lustful thoughts and acts, and uh, even today, pornography use, right? Jesus uh, implicitly, why would we say that? Because Jesus implicitly called out even what we look at and what we think about, did he not, when he spoke in Matthew uh, 5, verses uh, 27 to 30. He, uh, he says this, very convicting for us. He says, have, you, have heard it, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. Right? Probably everybody's on the same page right there with him when we get to that point. You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go to hell. So Jesus uses hyperbolic language to talk about the extent to which we are to battle in repentance of our sins. And he even talks about it's what we look at and think about to that level. So there's impurity, but there's also in, in verse 3 of, chap, uh, of chapter 5 of Ephesians, covetous, alternatively greed in the NIV. This is wanting more, what you don't have. Right? Now there's a legitimate wanting more, right? If I'm starving and I ask you for a sandwich, hopefully you'd give me one, that's a legitimate wanting more, right? That's a God-given appetite there. But, if, but, if it, but this is a, an inappropriate desire for more, that which is not yours to have. Deuteronomy 5.21 is helpful. It says, and you should not covet your neighbor's wife. By the way, there's a, probably an example of sexual coveting, right? Uh, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbors. And covetousness, helpfully, to us as believers, is the opposite of what? Contentment. And uh, being content with and thankful for what God has already given you. And the beautiful thing is if we cultivate contentment in our life by his grace, it's an antidote to the disease of covetousness that can arise in our hearts. Right? And given the context, this could be sexual coveting, but we can also covet things like money and possessions, right? Our minds are of no limit as to things that we inordinately aspire after. People, by the way, might falsely list these kinds of sins. People might falsely in our society think, oh, man, this freedom, man, that's living free. No, it's not. Because freedom is not living in bondage to not say, the inability to say no to what you shouldn't do. True freedom is the freedom to what? Love God. To walk in love. And walking in love is the antithesis of these things. Christianity is not about a bunch of rules or legalisms or law, right? It's about love. We're doing this by walking in love. That's the impetus behind this. It's not a finger-wagging self-righteousness, but a walking in love, imitating God who is love. And this kind of slavery that people have to these kinds of things, some of us may have experienced it. Pornography is a great example in our modern-day culture. It's a cancer and evil in our society. It's a form of impurity and covetousness. And the dangerous thing about it, even though people minimize it so often, is it's, it operates like a drug addiction, right? Brain science has pointed this out. Because it offers short and exaggerated dopamine spikes in the brain, hijacks the brain, but it ultimately delivers things like shame, even addiction, and many other things. It's a sort of suffocating slow fade. And Ted Shimmer, he's founder of a ministry called The Freedom Fight. It's a Christian ministry that helps people find freedom in this area. I'll mention them again in a moment. But he points out that hi pornography hijacks the brain based on brain science. And it causes people to want to seek out a novel but sinful, damaging sort of cardboard counterfeit to the real and better and ultimate sexual intimacy, right, that God so wonderfully and brilliantly invented, thought up, and gave to us to be enjoyed within the context of marriage. And so it's a lie. According to Kevin Skinner in Psychology Today, over half of all divorces in America, I think it's 56%, cite pornography as a contributing factor. 
So it's having a real impact, even though it's oftentimes hidden. And multiple states are even declaring it a health crisis. So it's kind of interesting the secular world's kind of catching on to this. There's a whole movement of young people trying to get off of it just because of the bad impacts on it. It's a selfish motivation, but it's still realizing the damaging effects. Christians struggle, many Christians do, with, with this as well. And in fact, even Josh McDowell, the noted author, he, he, he might be right in calling it, he calls it the greatest threat to the church today. Now, I don't know if it's the greatest, but it's probably one of them. Now, here's the thing. People will say about this particular kind of impurity, like, well, who, no one knows. Well, that's not true. God knows. And people will say, well, but it isn't hurting anyone. That is a big fat potato of a lie. It hurts people massively. First of all, it hurts you and me if we do it. It impacts your brain. It puts you in bondage. It brings feelings of shame, perhaps feelings of anxiety and depression. It hinders real relationships. And I can, there's a whole laundry list. I can just keep going. I don't have time. It harms others. Many in the porn industry are sex trafficked. Use creates command, demand, right? So why would we use and create the demand? It betrays our spouse if, our, if, it's, if we're married. It isolates us. And it sins against God. It grieves him. So apparently, I think it actually does hurt people. And think about our three values as a church. It militates against and hinders in us in loving God completely, loving all people compassionately, and loving ourselves correctly the things that we pursue here at Solid Rock. But more than anything, it's not walking in love. And these things in verse 3 are not who we are. That's why we're called out against it. And it isn't just what we do or think that matters in all this, but even how we talk. Apparently God's concerned even about what we say, because verse 4 says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgivings. This is, again, how to live as a saint in Christ, a believer. Even our speech and conduct to be appropriate to that, honoring him. Many of us may be guilty. I have been of low or crude talk or gutter language, but we do not need to continue in that. That's not who we are. And I agree with those who consider crude joking here to be joking with sexual innuendo. So common, right? I mean, people do this. Why do people do this, right? They do it to look cool or witty or worldly, right? And it's just kind of find something totally innocent, attach a sexual innuendo to it in an attempt at humor. Humor is good. Believers, we're in Christ. We have joy. Let's laugh. Let's enjoy things. But this kind of humor, though, is inappropriate for us who are in Christ. By the way, as Pastor Brad pointed out from last week, God doesn't just give us all these things to go to be against and not do, right? He gives us always things to do Instead, right? To pursue instead. And that's true here. It says, in the end of the verse, it says, instead, let there be thanksgiving. That's the kind of speech that we can have that honors God, right? And is living out who we are. It's something to do instead. And when we do that, it cultivates what? Or it comes out of what? A heart of contentment, which is, again, the antidote to covetousness. So he continues in verses 5 and 6. He says this. He says, for you, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually impure, I'm sorry, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So unless somebody comes to Christ and they stay a son of disobedience, That's what's happening. God is love, but he he righteously brings wrath on unrighteousness. Praise God, by the way, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, what happened on the cross? God's love for you and his wrath met on the cross and Jesus took what we deserve upon himself so we would never have to experience it. But now that we're in Christ, we would not want to live like the sons of disobedience who do face the possibility of the wrath of God unless they repent. So these verses show who the Gentiles are, the the unbelievers, those who haven't put their faith in Christ. And we see their pattern of life here. We see their identity. And in soberingly, we see their destiny. And I think Ted Schimmer summarizes just a couple sentences this, this, this stuff well, these verses. He says, Paul seems to be reminding the Ephesians, and I would add, and us, that true believers will be repentant of sexual sin and will strive for purity instead of settling into 
settling into an identity of immorality like the Gentiles, right? Believers are to be repentant and strive for purity. They will not be content to just complete, even though they may sin in certain ways like this, they will not be content to completely give their lives over to this sort of thing. Let it be a pattern of life marked by these things devoid of repentance. No assurance can be given to the non-repentant person, the impenitent. And there's a warning here in us, or for us here in verse 6. It says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So they still need Christ, and apart from him there's their destiny wrath of God. So the Ephesians and we are not to be deceived by empty words. What are empty words? Devoid of value, in error, false. So by application for us, Right? We ought to be on our guard and not be deceived, hoodwinked, by any false teaching right? that denies God's wrath or denies sin or minimizes sin or blame shifts or rationalizes about it. Or any, we ought to also be aware of any teaching that would creep into the church that perverts God's grace into a license for sin. Right? Jude 4 says this, it warns this. In Jude 4, it says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. When we put our faith in Jesus, we're putting our faith in the one who we are calling Master and Lord. So grace, when properly understood, should lead to more godliness, not less. And if you want to check me on that, you can go to Titus 2.11. It's a great verse. Verses 7 and 10 through 10 uh, uh, continue. It says, therefore, in light of all these things we just talked about, therefore do not become partners with them. Who is them? The sons of disobedience, the unbelievers. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness. But now... You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So we see now our second way to walk, right? We're to walk in love. Why? Because we're beloved children. But we're also now to walk, secondly, as children of light, right? We are to walk as children of light. And again, this is just us being who we are, right? Because what does it call us? What are we? Children of light. What does it call us? Light in the Lord. And so we're becoming more and more who we already are in Jesus Christ. How do we do this? Well, verses 7 and the verses that follow uh, help us. We can get 7 and 8 on the slide. right? One way is we don't join with those who are darkness and doing the things, those same things. What things? All the stuff we just talked about. When partners form a law firm together, right, uh, what are they doing? They, 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 they want to practice the same thing in the same direction. That's what we call it a law practice, right? So, uh, so as children of light, we are not to practice the same things in the same direction as the sons of disobedience and therefore partner with them in the same things. Why? Because it's not it's who they are, but it's not who we are. And notice here in the verses that this is who you and I were. Every last one of us, no matter what our sins, the best of us to the worst of us, were somewhere in that idea of darkness. Because it tells us that in Ephesians 5. And praise God, he's able to transform people. Nobody is outside the power of his transformation. I love 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It says, or do you not know that the righteous, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. No matter what, even if we weren't some of those, we were all in darkness at one point. And praise God, He did not leave you there if indeed you put your faith in Jesus. And you don't have to be there if you put your faith in Jesus. Now, uh, it's just not who you are now. Speaking personally, I'm not a perfect person. I'm I'm no prude, okay? I was an adult convert to Christ. I have a past, all right? But by God's mercy and grace, though I'm not yet who I will be fully in Christ, 
I am not who I once was, and neither are you if you're in Christ. And there's great hope in that, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we need to know who we are. Why did he spend three chapters in Ephesians putting that first, our identity, and then heed God's word in light of that? Some Christians, by the way, have and do sometimes fall into sexual sin. And we see that in our experience around us. We see it in the scripture. You, you, know, you look at the life of David. Uh, you could argue Samson. J- Paul had to write about sexual morality in 1 Corinthians. Right? It's not unforgivable. It's not the end of the road for the Christian. And the doorway of repentance is always open. So praise God we can receive God's grace and move forward toward purity. So here's some application for questions for all of us to pause on. I'm borrowing from Ted once again on this. Is there a secret sin in my life that I need to put to death? That's a question for each one of us to ask ourselves. And secondly, for all of us, how can I more fully live as a child of light? How can I more fully live as a child of light? And there may be some of us in this room or watching online who may wonder, uh, I want to move forward in this. I really do. I love the Lord. I hate my sin. You know, maybe it's a struggle with pornography or something like that. But I struggle. Help me. And here's the beautiful news. There is hope. There is help. There is healing through the Lord and others. So walk into it. Let me offer you a short-term path forward and long-term help. It's not everything we could say because the Bible has so much more to speak. But first, let me just encourage you, get real about your sin, each one of us. By the way, no matter who you are, even if these sins don't apply to you, listen, if you've never repented, if you've never turned to God and put your faith in Jesus for salvation, trusting only in his person and his finished work for you in his death on the cross in your place, his burial and resurrection, that's the first step. You need to come to Christ. And if you have been born again, then it's time to get real about your sin. You've got God's power to do it. Mourn it, right? Godly sorrow, not worldly sorrow. You can check out the scriptures on that, underlying that. Mourn it, confess it. What does that mean? It means to agree with God about it. To really own it. To not minimize it, rationalize it, deny it, blame shift, blame others, blame your childhood, so on and so forth. But to truly own it. That's the way of freedom. And then to repent, to turn from that and then turn to God, embracing his free forgiveness and his justification and just remembering that we are justified in him and we are sanctified, we can move forward. So we get real, we get all in, put it to death. We don't dabble in it, Romans 8, 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So this is a to-the-death thing. It's not like failing to pull the weeds out of your lawn, then mowing the lawn, and you say, hey, look, honey, look how good the lawn looks. It really does look good, but you know what? The, the weeds are still there because you didn't pull up the weeds. You've got to pull them up by the roots. We get all in, get radical. Remember Matthew 5, 27 to 30? What might this look like in our lives? It might mean putting a blocker on your phone and on your devices like Canopy or Covenant Eyes. In our own family, we use Canopy. Why? I'll speak personally. I don't trust myself. I don't trust my flesh. My address is not yet heaven. So I, don't, I, I want to be a man of integrity, and I'll do what I can to guard myself on that because I trust God, but not me. The other thing, too, is to be... Uh, some guys have gotten so uh, serious about it, they've got a flip phone in a world of smartphones. People do that. It's worth it. Be ruthless about the media we consume and what it stimulates to think, uh, us to think about. The best way not to go over the edge of a cliff is to not get near it, right? Why flirt with it? Romans 13, 14 is real serious. It says, make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And then fourthly, get help. If any of us struggle with this habitually, it is next to impossible, at least can feel like that, to get out of it without the help of the Lord and others. So for some of us, you may need to talk to a pastor, you may need to talk to a godly Christian counselor, or you may need to join a freedom fight group. You're like, well, what's that? So I got a sh- slide there. Um, To help people break free, right now, as pastor of discipleship, I'm pursuing an intensive discipleship program or certification through the Freedom Fight, Christian minister that I mentioned before, and they help people find freedom from pornography and sexual sin. That's what they do. This is a discipleship issue, all right? And I hope to start a a group uh, no later than February that is kind of a prototype of this, the first group for any who would want to be in it. 
And to start with, it'll be a group of men who together want to get and stay pure, whatever that is for them, right? In a culture that isn't. And my, well, men who habitually struggle with pornography or some sort of similar sin will be the ones most helped by this kind of group, right? There's a book out there called Every Man's Battle. This is for all men. This is for any men. Any man who wants to get pure or they're pure but want to stay pure or you know what? They want to help other men in that. So I invite you into that. And uh, it's great. There's it's tools within it that are biblically grounded, grace-based, gospel-centered, and based on brain science and clinical data. And they got a great track record, amazing track record. The best I've seen kind of ministry for this. And there's some good ones. So shoot me an email if you think you even may be interested out ahead of it. This is like the advertisement, way out ahead of it. And then uh, you can go to their website, freedomfight.org, take their 38 challenge, order the book, and so on if you want to get out ahead of it. We may even do a women's group out in the future, maybe. Uh, more men struggle in this area, but there are women who do as well. And uh, maybe that will... By the way, anybody who joins these groups, it's kept discreet, even the location of the meeting. We're not broadcasting this, so just want to make sure people are assured about that. So for all of us, we need to remember who we are, live it in view of verses 10, 8 through 10. Notice them, on the, on the, if we can get those on the screen. Uh, we are light. God is light. We're to imitate him, right? And so how do we walk as children of light in light of these verses? Well, by not doing the deeds of those who are in darkness. God gives us the power to do so by his spirit. Uh, by pursuing and bearing the fruit of light. What is that? Verse 9 tells us all that is, all that is good and right and true. So there's belief and behavior aspect there. And the truth is found where? In God's word. Another way is by discerning what is pleasing to the Lord, right? In view of verse 10 there. Well, how do we discern what's pleasing? If it's our aim to please him, we need to know what pleases him. How do we find out? It's through his word. And then walk in the light by not doing the deeds of darkness, but exposing them. Because look what verses 11 through 13 say. It says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Now, people will debate whether this is uh, words or deeds or both. I don't have time to fully unpack that for time. But here's what I will point us to. Didn't Jesus say to us in Matthew 5.16, he says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to to your Father who is in heaven. There is power in living as children of light. And when that light goes into the dark, light always wins. You can't turn on dark in a light room, but you can always turn light on in a dark room. Dark is not the opposite of light. It's the absence of light. Light always wins, even a tiny light in a very dark room. And we're lights in a dark world. Some people will be reviled by the light. They'll hide. They don't like it. Others might be convicted of it. Some might become light. And so we come to a place in verse 14. I love these words where it says, For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. These words are believed to have been maybe used at baptisms. They probably describe somebody coming alive to Jesus Christ for the first time. And if you're in Christ, they describe what happened to you. The sleeper is awake, and they're given new life. Folks, we have been raised up, have we not? If you're in Christ... You are now elevated. You are not asleep. You are not dead. You are alive. Christ shines on them here. Christ has shined on us. If you're in Christ, he's shined on you. So let his light shine from you. Amen? How? Be who you are. Be more and more who you already are. Let's pray. Father, it's good to know this. It's another thing to live it out. But thank you that you, you've not only given us your word, you've given us your spirit. We're not orphans. We have supernatural power to do what we would have no power to do in and of ourselves. And so, Lord, in the days ahead, by the power of your spirit, in light of your word, turn the light on. Turn it on in us, through us, around us, and by us in this dark world. Help us to walk as children of light. Lord, help us to walk in love. Make us to be, help us to be imitators of God. We pray in Jesus' awesome name.